So before giving and starting the webinar, I provide a few technical notes. We have uh, an interpretation into French. For the English translation, click on the globe button in the lower part of the screen and choose English. If you do not wish to hear the original audio in the background, just click on the mute original audio. Please mute your microphone at all time unless asked to unmute it by the moderators. Please use the question and answer function to submit all your questions. They will be translated simultaneously to French when read by the moderator. Should you wish to take the floor in French, make sure to exit the English interpretation channel to avoid the interferences. If you have any problem hearing properly the session, please contact us through the chat. Thank you. So, I would uh, definitely start and open this uh, webinar, which is uh, organized by FAO, the Food and Agriculture Organization, together with Politecnico di Milano, the Department of Architecture and Urban Studies, and African Center for Cities, ACC. Today, and together with us, I'm happy to introduce uh, Dr. Zituni Uldada, and then we have uh, a keynote speakers, uh, Professor Stefano Boeri from Politecnico di Milano and uh, Professor Garrett Asen from African Center for Cities. After the keynote session, we will uh, host uh, a question and answer uh, discussion. Uh, so let me first introduce uh, uh, Dr. Uld Zada from uh, FAO. He is uh, currently Deputy Director in the Office of Climate Change, Biodiversity and the Environment at the Food and Agriculture Organization in Rome. Uh, please, uh, Mr. Uh, Uld Zada, I give you the floor. Uh, thank you very much, Marianne. Thank you for this kind invitation and greetings everyone, all the, the participants, Ladies and gentlemen, everyone, welcome very much to this webinar on integration of urban agriculture, forestry and food system into urban planning. So it's my pleasure to, to set this off and, and just say a few words to set this event into the context. Um, you know, we are, we are at a situation where obviously climate change is, is really getting worse in affecting our life all around the world and all um, the economies around the world, uh, and particularly the impact that um, climate change is having on, on food security. Uh, so all the planning, the policies and measures that, that we do, that you really have to take into account, not just the immediate term, but um, the medium, medium and, and long term, because all policies and planning we do will, will affect how we're going to live in the near future and, and beyond. Um, so if we look at what's happening now and how the population is going to evolve between now and the next 30 years or, and, or so, particularly with regard of how we live our lives in cities and how we interact with cities, how we manage and plan our um, life around the infrastructure in, in cities. Um, there are some alarming figures, actually, if we look at how today 50 5% of the world population lives in urban areas. And the prediction is that in the next 30 years or so, by 2050, the urban population is expected to reach almost two thirds. And over 90% of this increase will occur in the urban areas of low income countries, especially in Asia and Africa, uh, where the pace of urbanization is, is really alarming, is, is very high. So this growing population implies that we will be putting more pressure on natural resources in how will people live, how much, what would we 
consume in terms of food, where would we live, how would we move around in terms of transportation, what sources of energy would we have in all these questions, they're so interlinked. So this growing rate of population implies that we'll be putting more pressure on natural resources because our demand for food, for water, energy, land, transportation, etc., is going to increase, of course. And, and this is also alarming because already today in cities, or well, the cities already consume about 70% of the global food supply and almost 80% of the total energy that is produced around the world. While cities at the same time produce around 70% of the global waste. So you can see the challenges already exist and they will be even worse if we continue in the same way business as usual without rethinking how we plan our cities and how we plan our life in, in cities. So many of these urban and very urban communities are exposed to, to food and nutrition insecurity already and undernourishment. Uh, also, um, in parallel to this, we have increased obesity and overweight. You know, we have around 811 people who go hungry every day around the world and around 2 billion people who are either um, obese or overweight. So the cities at the moment, they are really overexploiting many of the resources such as water and, and food and energy, um, including in many cities in developing countries. So the trend will be alarming if it's continued in, in this way. Um, we see, for example, in many developing countries, the lack of wastewater treatment and appropriate sewage system will lead into, it's already leading into pollution. And my point here is that the situation will get worse if we continue in this way. So expanding the cities are also consuming obviously land in, in, in the building of the various habitation that we have around cities and cities growing around the world. It's contributing to deforestation as well because we need to make space for, for cities, uh, dwellings and for infrastructure. Um, and these obviously have negative effect on, on the water quality, on increasing floods and, and um, water scarcity and, and other challenges. So the cities are already contributing to climate change, basically, uh, accounting for around 70% of global energy related greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and we know in terms of emissions, you know, for, for the food systems, food systems as a whole, not just agriculture, they emit around 30% of the, the global greenhouse gas emissions. And in addition to that, we're wasting a lot of food, the third of the food produced for human consumption that is thrown away. And associated with that is around 8% that goes into greenhouse gas emissions. So these are huge challenges. And to address these challenges, this is why we need to rethink in the way of how we plan urban and peri-urban areas in dealing with these challenges, identifying what needs to be done at this local level um, to make sure that we move in towards more inclusive, resilient and green space and cities that can actually, uh, you know, obviously allow people to, to live in, in harmony with, with the environment. And this is why uh, a couple of years ago, uh, our director general launched this initiative, FAO Green Cities Initiative. And the aim of this initiative is to build this well being I've been talking about of urban dwellers and resilient cities to these shocks that we are facing, that they increase with time. And the aim is to do this by maximizing the provision of these ecosystems, goods and services in the cities, and also fostering the sustainable and climate resilient practices and take advantage of the technologies and innovation to improve the local food production. And the management of urban forests and trees, which is extremely important to have greeners, particularly in terms of trees and, and, and forests in cities, because they have so much advantage 
and benefits, not just for climate change, but for biodiversity and the well-being of people as well. And the other thing also is by promoting sustainable and inclusive urban and peri-urban development. So one of the objectives of these Green Cities initiatives is to, to support the creation of adequate enabling conditions or enabling environment that would help cities address these cross-cutting challenges that I spoke about, including the climate change and adaptation to climate change, health issues in cities, and access to nutritious and, and healthy food, in addition to creation, obviously, of employment and having equitable economic and, and social development in, in cities. And I'm really pleased that um, at this stage, you know, with this collaboration with the Politecnico di Milano and the African Center for Cities, we're having this event today. You know, we developed this training um, course on the integration of urban and peri-urban agriculture, the urban and peri-urban forestry, and urban um, and peri-urban food system um, with a particular focus on municipal officers in the Africa region. So we're pleased that at the moment we have 12 African cities who have been selected for the six month training course that will be tailored to the needs of these targeted cities. And I think that's really critical. It's very important, obviously, that we provide a course that responds to what the cities need. You know, the, the cities, they are not all the same. They have different needs and capabilities and capacities and ge geographical locations. And to maximize the impact of training course, it has to respond to what works in these cities. And by doing that also, we really hope that we'll be able to gain that experience and for this training package then to be replicated so that other cities around the world will also benefit from this and help build their capacity. So the aim of this um, event, this training course, is to highlight the importance of integrating planning and on the relationship between planning and food systems, urban forestry and urban agriculture, and really the importance of this, given the current climate or where we are with the succession of crises, is to focus on solutions. It's the time of, to see how training can actually focus on what needs to happen to solve the challenges I mentioned earlier the problems, the, the different challenges that cities are uh, facing and also around the world, you know, the global crises that, that we face today, which are interlinked. And this is the reality in cities. And as I mentioned earlier, if you look at how cities are evolving, it's alarming in terms of how much pressure will be put on the use of natural resources. So we really need to, to rethink of how we live our lives basically by interacting and living in cities and using natural resources more smartly and more efficiently rather than continuing business as usual, which, which will lead us to catastrophe, obviously. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change keeps publishing reports now and then and bringing in new evidence of showing how we are living in a time of emergency because everything we're doing is not enough to help us avoid the danger of climate change. And if you look at the cities that are really the center of so many activities and dwellings and infrastructure and the use of resources and the generation of waste, et cetera, it's really critical that, that we train people, that we provide the evidence and, and skills um, support and also tools and everything we need to, to see how we can avoid this in, in the future. So this is really just to set the scene. So again, welcome everyone. <clears throat> Thank you to all the presenters, everyone taking part in this. And I really wish you really very dynamic and, and fruitful event because there is so much to talk about, so much to address. And I really look forward to, to your discussions and the outcome of how this is going to help us with the Green Cities Initiative 
now and going forward to address this important issue. So thank you very much again uh, for taking part in this. And back to you, Maria. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Zituni Uldada. Uh, now we uh, open the uh, floor to the two keynote uh, lecturers. The first, uh, and I'll uh, introduce him, is uh, Professor Stefano Boeri, uh, who's uh, from Politecnico di Milano. He is an architect and urban planner. Uh, he has been working in uh, different uh, uh, parts of the world, including the master plan for the Tirana 2030, the uh, project the, for the ecological transition for uh, Grand Genève in Switzerland. And um, he has been uh, working in, at the urban scale with projects such as the Bosco Verticale in uh, Milano, in Eindhoven, uh, in, um, and in Egypt. I give you the floor to Stefano Boeri. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Maria Chiara. Thank you all of you for inviting me. Well, uh, I will spend my 20 minutes time showing some of the projects and the ideas that we have developed in the last years. And as you probably know, uh, my, my office in Milano and Shanghai basically are oriented to implement uh, environmental uh, and uh, biodiversity uh, presences in uh, urban conditions. So uh, this title, the title of this book, uh, Green Obsession, I think is perfectly mirroring what we do. Uh, and uh, this is starting from a consideration about uh, uh, how cities are growing. Uh, uh, basically cities, uh, if we could really put together what is an urban condition all over the world, different size of city, probably will not cover more than the 3% uh, of the emerging land of the planet. But uh, we know well that this uh, Pangea, uh, which is uh, growing, uh, uh, it's consuming more than 70% of the the resources and is producing more than 75% of the CO2 emissions that are as a region of, of climate change. And that, uh, that's simply to, to also to underline how uh, this amazing explosion of the urban phenomena all over the world, the planet, it's uh, really, uh, let's say, changing its geographical patterns. Uh, and basically, uh, on the other side, if we consider forests, and, uh, and that's something that is very important for, for, for me, for us, and for FAO, we have worked a lot on, on, this, on this concept. If we consider forest, we will probably not cover more than 30% of the surface of the emerging end of the planet, uh, but uh, this 30% is uh, essential for, for the life, for our life, uh, for our to live in such of the planet. Uh, and not simply because the forests are absorbing this, the 30, 35% of the CO2 emissions. So basically we don't have any other tool to absorb the CO2, but we have already emission except trees and plants. Uh, we, we know this well, and we know how uh, trees could uh, easily contribute to our attempt to, let's say, to, 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 to tackle climate change, to reduce the disadvantages of climate change. Uh, this is something which could be extremely contradictory. That's uh, just to show you some uh, uh, images that are authentic uh, installation we did uh, 20 years ago in Dennis Biennale together with Jeremy Rifkin, where we are talking about three possible uh, dystopias. One is to have a city which is completely open to other living species. Another is uh, to have a city which is completely covered by the cultural field. And the third is to have a city which is completely covered by uh, mechanical tools that works for renewable energies. So I think we have to, to assume an holistic perspective on, on that. And that's what we are trying to do. And one of the main activity we have is to work with uh, uh, the urban forestation. That's for instance, is something that we're doing in Milano with Maria Chiara Pastor and this uh, amazing uh, to, to, to plant 3 million of uh, new trees in, a, in the Milano metropolitan environment. And that's a project we started some years ago with a, an idea of connecting a system of abandoned array yards that are, let's say, surrounding the urban context and that uh, system of uh, connection and connectivity together with biodiversity are two keywords, two keywords for what we do, what is necessary to do is to, let's say, reintroduce 
natural environment in our in our in our cities. Belay <laughs> this something we had done in other in other context. And Chiara was was talking about the Tirana. Tirana we started in 2014 with the master plan, but we are considering the opportunity to plant 300,000 plants all over the city and many green, green rings inside the urban uh, concept inside the urban environment. And basically, this project is started and is done now. More than 150,000 plants have been planted. And we are also designing a new district after the earthquake of two years ago that is considered like a totally green district where, uh, let's say, agricultural fields, uh, green environment together with urban conditions connected and with a new idea of a city of proximity where any citizen could really reach what he needs for his life in terms of cultural activities in terms of, uh, of let's say health activity and also in terms of uh, let's say commercial presence it's available uh, has uh, as it's been equipped now the 50 minus time or in a, a dimension of uh, not more than 500 meters uh, so uh, that's that's what we have done in in tirana but probably one of the most interesting project we done with our office in China was together with the slow food organization was to imagine how to try to propose something that could reduce the migration from the countryside to, the, to, to let's say to metropolis but it's let's say it in so much as the China condition we uh, let's say basically it's, it's, it's clear to be like a migration of 14, 15 millions of people that uh, every year are uh, abandoning uh, agricultural field or abandoning agricultural field and countryside. And uh, so the idea was to create a system of, uh, let's say, uh, public utilities that could straighten the slow food idea to re-innovate, reinvent, regenerate uh, agricultural cultivation, uh, agricultural formation of product, cultural product into food in, uh, in the Chinese countryside. So that's what we were doing is to imagine in a champion of 100 count small villages to reintroduce in every village or in a cluster of village, uh, uh, a public school, uh, a public um, uh, public museum, and a public library. And this is three small, let's say, device that could really uh, help the families to imagine the future of their sons of their nephews and to imagine how we could interest in to come back or to stay. Uh, this is Geneva. Geneva was uh, one of our last projects. The idea was to imagine an extension of the city, not along the lake, but connecting Geneva with the NSC and uh, putting this ring of a uh, system of uh, green uh, villages uh, on, on the top uh, of the new uh, SRR and CERN accelerate particle accelerator. So as the idea also to imagine to 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 use the capacity of producing of, uh, of green energy that uh, the new accelerator will have. But basically the most, most important idea is to have at the center of the city not a church, not a square, not a mosque, not a synagogue, but a mountain. A mountain with its amazing biodiversity of living species. So conceptually, a city that has a mountain at the center, a metropolis has a mountain at the center, it's, it's a really for us a new concept of a possible metropolis. Same concept was developed in other parts. This is South America, this is Central America, is Mexico, where we had designed two years ago this forest, Mark Forest City. Uh, basically, is a city for 130,000 people, basically students and teachers of the new six universities that are planning to, to move to Cancun, Southeast Mexico. And also in the case, you see a buffer of uh, greenhouses and uh, agricultural fields that are aiming to add to their kind of self-sufficiency in terms of the natural production and food and food and food production. Uh, this is something that we have done also in a very, let's say, early context. Uh, this is, for instance, in Cairo, where we have planted uh, the extension of a part of, uh, of the new Cairo, imagining a, a, an environment that has to really to mix uh, environmental and natural conditions, and uh, also trying to make this, uh, uh, let's say, capable to work with a very sophisticated system of reuse and recycle water that are available in a different part of the city, but also with a very strong presence of green of green surfaces, not only horizontal and not only on the ground, but also imagining to have green roofs 
and to have green facade in Cairo. And this is free building that we are now in construction in, in New Cairo, uh, our free vertical forest that are really consider, considering the climate condition, considering uh, the selection of species that are more adaptable grow in this climate condition. And uh, these three projects are going to be built in the next years. Just to conclude, uh, well, the, the relation between urban planning and I say and food policy is for us extremely important. We started to consider that many years ago uh, uh, in Milano, uh, when we were working with the idea of, uh, of a kind of orbital forest, which were also part of a productive forest and also a part of agricultural field related to the presence of, of forest. But uh, uh, the most important experience we had was Expo 2015. We were designing together with Jacques Herzog uh, and uh, uh, Ridiki Bardet, the master plan of our expo. And at the beginning of that, there was the idea to, let's say, make an expo who was done by the presence of local farmers coming from the world that has to show their technology and the capacity to cultivate ground. Uh, basically, the idea was to really to put in evidence the transformation of agricultural products into food. Uh, that was not totally possible, as you know, so uh, Expo is a basically a commercial event, but that idea uh, remained as one of the main reference of our work also in other, in other uh, context, uh, like in this one where we are proposing to regenerate all the farms that are surrounding Milano and to transform them in a space that uh, that can be like say virtualized the necessity to have a proximity condition connected with agriculture in our condition. Uh, on the same level in China we have proposed a different project that are uh, inserting or if you want including uh, greenhouses in vertical forests so there are buildings that have uh, plants, trees, but also greenhouses on their different facades. And the same project we are now developing in Dubai and in other parts, in other also arid context. Uh, and uh, that's another very important issue. But just to conclude, really, I think that I was that was thinking about connection and biodiversity. I think bioconnection is a, is a key word. Uh, we were part uh, some uh, two years ago, three years ago, in New York of the Forum, Climate Change Forum, and. Uh, you, you, for sure, you know this this project by by Heller, who is an amazing, amazing researcher, uh, a Weller in a in a, in a North America, and, uh, and uh, what he's proposing is to create a kind of war park, which is a result of a combination uh, of a system of biodiversity corridors that are connecting the biodiversity hotspots all over the world, and he's showing how this bioconnection could multiplicate uh, the advantages of, of uh, let's say, uh, biodiversity oasis. And uh, this is something that we know, uh, that you know very well, because uh, the experience of uh, the green grid world in uh, sub-Saharan, it's, uh, it's uh, super interesting and it's probably the unique uh, model of reference model we have now. And, uh, and this model uh, with all this contradiction is there. And so I think we have to really to work uh, together to, to show uh, the limits, but also the amazing perspective of the proposal and to imagine how we could extend it also in other parts of the world like we are trying to do in South Europe. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Professor Stefano Boeri. Um, and now I would like to introduce and give the floor to Dr. Garrett Asom. Uh, Garen has been a researcher in the Food System Research Grouping at the African Center for Cities at the University of Cape Town since 2014. Garen's research uses a food as a lens to try and understand the contemporary challenges and opportunities and to investigate the dramatic transition taking place in African and Southern cities. While his research focuses on uh, urban food, the scope of the research spans, from, uh, spans the urban landscape. Food provides a, a useful means to understand the connection between the food system and the urban system. Garrett, the floor is yours. And uh, we originally planned to have uh, Jane uh, in this speech. Unfortunately, uh, she was um, unable to join and, and she is uh, apologizing. And I really thank Garrett uh, for providing um, a keynote uh, session. Thank you, Garrett. Thank you, Maria. And Good afternoon to everyone and welcome to colleagues and 
others that I haven't seen for a long time. And again, just to echo Jane's apology, she's unfortunately in a hospital with her child right now. So I think that took priority. So I've been working with her and been collaborating with yourselves um, on this work going forward. So this is largely her work, but I will be presenting it. Um, but, and I just, yeah, our apologies for not being here. I think our work is going to enter this discussion in a from a slightly different entry point. This is not to discount what has been spoken about already in terms of urban greening, urban forestry, and urban agriculture. It's to come into this conversation from the sort of food systems perspective. And I think for me, what is really fascinating hearing Stefano's kind of presentation now is how these connect and how what I will hopefully present can hopefully build a connection between these two different entry points. Um, I will focus largely on planning and, and some of that work and reference work that we've done. And to, to Florence, I might not have fan, as fantastic graphics. I'm not an architect, so I, I'll rely on the images and, and some of that, but hopefully not too many words. Um, so I'd like to start by trying to sort of center our work where we have been working and particularly as people working on the urban food system and to use the high level panel of experts definition of food security that they've framed and suggested as an alternative. This doesn't change the earlier definition of all people at all times having physical, economic, et cetera. I won't go into that, one can read that. But I do want to ask this question of what happens then when we enter into the urban space and we start to engage food through these different lenses of urban greening, of urban forestry, of the food system. And are there other dimensions of the definition of food security that one might take? How do we move that beyond simply thinking about availability and perhaps questions of access to really start asking questions about stability as an example and something that is critically important now given the Ukraine-Russian uh, conflict that we're involved in uh, that we, we're seeing and how that is influencing stability, but also uh, as uh, Dr. Aldora spoke about the sustainability of that system. But also for us, what is increasingly important in the urban space is to start asking questions around agency and what that might mean. How these all come together and how they're governed in the urban space is something that I hope we can nuance and go into in quite a lot of detail through the process of this course and start to speak about how these various different entry points all intersect. So this is a, a slide which is way too wordy and I apologize up front. The intention here is just to argue and to make the point that supports perhaps uh, Dr. Aldoda's kind of notion of the tension that we sit with around both the climatic and wider environmental impacts of the food systems and the climatic and wider impacts of the urban system. And for African cities, for me, uh, working in these contexts, we sit with a very unique situation. From the cities we saw in the global north have largely been built, or what we saw in Stefano's presentation is a lot of new build or real adaptation. For African cities, we've been built now. They're in construction, they're moving, they're rapidly growing as it was presented. And how do we avoid the lock-ins that emerged in past development regimes? How do we take on this context of these two intersecting systems to rethink how we understand and plan the cities, to not get rid of green spaces, but to enhance that as a key urban infrastructure, to see peri-urban land as a central part of the urban space, rather than allow sprawls and shopping malls to be developed on that. So how do we think of these components as being central? And I would argue, and some of you heard me saying this before, is that African cities have this really unique opportunity to fundamentally change how we do urbanization and how we do food. But we sit at this really interesting moment where in order to do that, the food system and food insecurity is, a, I would argue, is a fundamentally urban question. The food system is informed and informs spatial form and urban. It informs and is informed by the urban economy. It is deeply connected into urban politics, but equally it is as important for social dynamics, how society engages in these cities. And what this means is it means that we really have to think very much around how the food system is, is governed in the urban space. And what is the role of urban managers, 
mayors, politicians, in terms of how these spaces are governed and how we start to understand the food system and equally how they are planned. And the reason I say this is that the food is central to the urban space. And here I use a quote, which is admittedly from Canada, but I, in our work that we've done in many African cities, this holds true. The percentages might differ, but I'll read it out. More than any of our other biological needs, the choices we make about food affects the shape, style, pulse, smell, look, feel, health, economy, street life, and infrastructure of our cities. One way or another, these choices account for 20% of all retail sales, 20% of service jobs, industrial jobs, 10% of car trips, perhaps a lot less in African cities, a large portion of chronic diseases and increasing in African cities, fossil fuel and air pollution contributions, as well as a large proportion of all garbage and sewage that is generated as a result of it. And the question that Wayne Roberts asked was, why is it then that so few people make the connection to the obvious, that the city is what it eats? So perhaps, as he said, an, an obvious comment, but it is really to then say, all right, so then what does that mean for planning? What does that mean for trying to create a cities that are greener and more nourishing and more generative in these processes? And how do we start to think about planning these questions? And most importantly, how do these planning decisions start to take place in the city? In our work with local governments across African cities, frequently we have this comment that most governments say, we have no mandate to govern the food system. Food is something that is managed by rural departments of agriculture at a national ministry, perhaps at a county or a provincial ministry scale. And the work that urban governance actors do in terms of food is not necessarily as pronounced and is limiting in terms of a lot of what they are able to do. And I want to just pick up on a number of different examples here. And one of them is to speak to urban agriculture. In many cities that we work, urban agriculture is still frowned upon. Now, there are different reasons for this, and I would say that history matters here. Often there are colonial rules and laws connected, for example, to malarial outbreaks, which prohibited the growing of food in areas. The links between malaria we found that through other research is often spurious. It's not necessarily, it wasn't ever there. It was just a means with which to try and create a specific type of city. So there is this history of not allowing urban food growing to city, despite its prominence and despite how it's taken place. Later, as a result of structural adjustment processes, growing food in cities was at times seen as a threat in some ways to rural agriculture, but later also seen as a way to diffuse uh, the fall into poverty and things like that, which took place. So there are various different rulings, bylaws that enable, prohibit, constrain the growing of food in cities. Equally, the example of uh, Epworth outside Harare, the hammer mills, work that we've been doing there, we found over 140 hammer mills in Epworth itself. All of these are illegal. None of them were allowed to be built because hammer mills had to take place in formal industrial areas. And so this understanding of a hammer mill of a maize processing as being part of a formal industrial process gives an indication of how policy actors in the past understood the food system and understood the type of food system that was largely formal, largely industrialized. The same with markets. Uh, and you use the example here of the sort of Markets Act that took place in Zambia and to Patson, uh, correct me if I'm misquoting some of the aspects around this, but the Markets Act was very clear, the original Markets Act, in terms of what could be sold in the markets, who could be selling, what was allowed to be sold in the markets, and what was prohibited from being sold elsewhere, even to the point of controlling prices, whilst later acts, amendments to that act, had to remove the control of prices. But it shows how, despite this claim of no mandate, city actors are playing a very direct role in influencing, impacting, and engaging in the food system. In the case of the Markets Act, often through the regulations and in the case of Epworth, 
these regulations were criminalizing a lot of activities that happened in African cities, forcing them to be then be subject to punitive actions, et cetera. But equally in that process, they were never part of planning, but also by not being part of planning, they were never integrated into the system through infrastructure access, et cetera. So one starts to then have these tensions that plays out across these cities and conflicts, et cetera, et cetera. But as Kami Pathakuchi has argued, inaction in the planning environment does not have neutral consequences. It often generates negative outcomes. And so are, is the rapid rise in non-communicable diseases, these other issues that we're encountering in African cities at the moment, are these as a result of this kind of absent planning mandate? And I would argue most definitely. And so how do we then start to plan these processes? This doesn't mean that cities haven't been planning and haven't been engaging. And again, to use the, the Kitwe example, and I use this because I was actually in conversations just last week with the mayor of Kitwe about some of the, what they are planning for this market. But what we saw in our time doing work there is that international donors were funding the, the municipality to help them relocate the wholesale market to try and decongest a very congested market into a market called Nakadole on the periphery, which has effectively now become a white elephant. And I, I'm not going to, this is not just to use the Kitwe example all the time, the same as an example of a trader mall in Dar es Salaam, where we're starting to see an attempt to engage in the food system without deeply engaging in the wider food system planning. We're trying to address a single issue in the food system without understanding the wider context. And I'll come back to some of those discussions just now. But at the same time, we're seeing incredible tensions around urban land and peri-urban land. And here, to use the example of the Philippi horticultural area, um, our colleagues on the line from Johannesburg, I'm sure, in the area of Midrand would be well aware of the tensions around some of that, but elsewhere in many other cities. And so trying to understand these tensions and what that might mean. But what we saw in the case of the Philippi area is that discussions, the local politics, everything that took place around this area was never around food. It was around housing. It was around redesigning transport. It was around creating spaces for retail and a whole set of actions that all ignored the food question specifically. Likewise, in Kasumu, I've just come from the Africa City Summit, as you drive on the peri-urban areas, you see signs, unlike in other areas, we are saying land for sale, you're seeing signs saying land is not for sale. And it describes this tension between the peri-urban areas where people are hoping to try and retain that land and maintain it. And so for us, the food system is not just around those particular aspects, it connects directly into a whole set of other aspects which are absolutely the mandate of urban governance actors. The amount of energy, that some of you who might have recognized the sign for the three minute noodles, the energy access that people might have in a particular area is directly linked to their food choices. I saw people pre preparing uh, you know, traditional foods such as uh, you know, maize meal or maize porridge, shima, et cetera, et cetera. It's very difficult to prepare that if you have limited access to energy and very costly and increasingly so at the moment. And also eroding urban forestry, et cetera, et cetera. So people might choose then to take the two minute noodles, likewise around water access and sanitation. These aspects play a fundamental role in the food system outcomes. And how do we then start to think about food systems planning and about being food specific, as well as being sensitive to different types of food planning that we might engage in. So here again, I, I made mention of this earlier and I'll, I'll read through this rather long quote and my apologies, the food challenges facing our cities are immense, but the food system also provides a new and imaginative entry points for transitioning, transitioning cities to more sustainable, just and equitable spaces for all. From a design of a house to new plans for market spaces to major bulk infrastructure, food sensitive approach can radically transform the cities. And here I want to make a point of many African cities that we face, the food system infrastructure that they have now is a legacy of 1920s, 1930s and 1940s infrastructure. They're a legacy of planning from those particular times. And so for us and the concept and the centrality of planning is this need to start to say, all right, what will the food system in our cities look like 
20, 30, 50 years from now. What we design in those cities now, those new and emerging and rapidly growing cities as was described, are going to have a fundamental impact on the future generations of most African urbanites, but also most Africans. And so how do we do this? And again, to use just the corner market as a brief example, it, what is really necessary is to understand the entire urban food system and its connections to other systems. So how does that connect to health? How does it connect to the economy? How does it connect to the various different areas? But also understand local government mandates. The city of Cape Town for years in our engagement has always said food is not our mandate. Recently, the resilience department of the city did a mapping of all the different departments and policies that spoke to food and found over 40 departments um, and projects that were engaged in food in some or other way. So this engagement in the food system is essential to start building a wider understanding. Yes, projects are important. They might be political. They might achieve a certain level of attention. But how do we start to plan and engage the wider urban system across the diversity of the city? Here in the case of Chisikone, um, if one can see it here, there are a whole set of wholesalers and processors that sit here and operate from here. If one travels down from fish traders to everywhere else, key transit interchanges that sit over here, a number of processes here where things are taking place. And so this market is central to downtown, to the lived reality of every day in the cities. Yes, I accept in my conversations with the mayor is that how difficult it is to manage the space that is really overcrowded. But is moving it to the periphery of the city the ideal option? How does one start to integrate this into the area? Is consuming peri-urban land that could be used for urban agriculture, is that the option? How do we rethink this area? The work that was done by others from the Green City of Guido and your teams of how the food flowed into this area, the centrality of the market, particularly in intermediary towns, of coalescing the, work, the, growing, the food that is grown in the regional area, how that comes in and, and is supported through these local markets. We found fish traders going right up to the lakes in north of Zambia, etc., who are selling that produce here. These are key parts of the food system. They can support other components, such as urban greening and urban forestry, and how do we rethink them from a wider food systems perspective. But that knowledge of understanding the wider food system provides us the entry points into where actions can be taken and governance can be realigned but also how it's not just about the Ministry of Agriculture, how this might be health, it might be planning, it might be econo economics and a, a set of other aspects. But this is tough and we can't lay all these obligations on planners and expect them to suddenly recreate and kind of be the kind of magic wand that gets waved across African cities. Past histories, often the legacies from colonialism, apartheid elsewhere, mean that there, and because of officious policies and things like that, that have created illegality, there's a significant trust deficit. How we deal and engage with that requires a very different form of engagement, different forms of processes, how that gets engaged. We have these oppositional logics. There's this idea of formal planning. A colleague of mine who's a planner in the city of Accra has just done a study of the, the Acromall enclave and how the formal planning doesn't recognize how the street vendors operate. And there's this dynamic tension where formal planning imagines planning, servicing, construction, and occupancy. But in reality, many African cities occupy first and then seek recognition and appreciation through a various different forms of politics. And so how we deal with that? This notion of an absent food mandate means that often there isn't a political will in, if food isn't political, if people aren't demanding better quality food, et cetera, often politics has got so much else to challenge and engage in that food becomes secondary. So how do the planners engage in all of this? But equally, and particularly in, in smaller cities where fiscal allocations and staffing is limited, there is a real challenge with capacity. And so these are things that need to be considered and need some realistic engagement and understanding of how we engage these different processes. So I want to conclude that I, I would like to say that I think what this course is going to offer is a way to engage in these multiple components that I've tried to present here along with Jane in her absence. How we start to ask these questions, how we start to delve deeply into questions of food sensitive and food specific planning, how we engage in questions of governance, how do we ask questions around agency, are there different types of processes that we can engage in here? 
We've already started to develop some resources and these will be handed out and used as part of the course. Um, but I'll leave it there and I'd welcome to take any questions and comments that come along. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Dr. Garrett Asim. Um, we have a dedicated question and answer um, line. So as I repeated, uh, there are already two uh, questions aligned and uh, please uh, drop your question over there. And um, for the translation, uh, we also have uh, uh, simultaneous translation. So if you want to write it in French, please uh, do not worry about that. Um, I think that uh, the two presentation uh, raised uh, uh, the question of integration, which is also the core of our uh, training, the integration between planning policies and the city, I would say, Garrett, uh, in the sense that it's not a specific field, but it's the whole city. Um, so you, you mentioned as a key element, the, un the understanding of the role of the food system. So the, from one side, we have understanding uh, food system, urban forestry as a key tool, and then the understanding of the city from the other side and how to connect these two and the other elements uh, for a better planning and for better cities. Um, so uh, I read uh, the question from uh, Olusei Fabigli. I want to know the challenges of introducing urban planning policy shift to organic cities like Cairo. Can we introduce green in the already built up areas? And if yes, does it require a model comprehensive master plan or just a pilot? So I will take the chance to answer to this question. And then I will also ask my, colleague from, my colleagues from FAO uh, to um, possibly build up on this question. So it is definitely one of our challenges to introduce and to integrate green system within our built up areas. So it is a matter of not how, if it's possible, but how to do it. So to how, uh, and, so the question is yes, and what we do and we, what we need to do is to understand what are the areas. So we have a comp uh, very different land use policies. In our city, we have abandoned area, we have agricultural fields, we have uh, cemeteries, we have uh, residential area, we have industrial area. All of them, they compose the city. Each of them have uh, some uh, spare uh, space, which, can host uh, trees and shrubs and green and grass. Uh, on the other side, we really need to work and to understand which are the area that can host a more specific and uh, transformative change. This change means that if at the moment we have a parking lot, small or big, for instance, uh, we can introduce and reintroduce green spaces within those area. Uh, we can work uh, into uh, those uh, 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 avenues uh, and streets which are not hosting trees and shrub and to integrate them. Of course, it's a very um, challenging method because we, uh, we know that there are mobility issues from one side and from the other side, we know that there are electric uh, sewage system which are already in the built city. But we really need to work and to understand which are the challenge, the specific challenges, and then to scale it up and to try to make the transformative change. Um, so to answer to the second part of the question, can we, um, uh, we need a model, model comprehensive master plan or it is just a pilot? I would say both in the sense that from one side, we really need to address this transformative change. And I built up the answer on what Garrett was mentioning on the role of the food system. On this side, we need to understand the, the role of green system and the role of uh, uh, the, the city itself. So what we are now and what we want to be. Uh, we need to understand where are uh, our green and blue infrastructure system and then to change it into a wider perspective to, to see what we can connect, what we can, uh, uh, change and embed the green system within. So uh, from one side, we need to have planning uh, policies aligned. And on the other side, 
we can start, we can demonstrate that we can make the change. So we can align the different uh, stakeholders. They can be formal or informal. It can be grassroots or we can do, be the municipality um, to organize and to uh, structure a pilot project. It can be with uh, the local university. It can be with the different association to build up uh, a pilot project to demonstrate and also to make a change in the local environment, it's always a very good matter. So I would say both of them are equally important. If they can work together, even better. I don't know if maybe Guido, if, if you want to like speak a bit on the Green Cities Initiative on, on this. Yeah, thank you, Maria Tiana. Uh, good, good morning, everybody. Yeah, a few complementing words to uh, to uh, to add uh, what Maria Chiara said, yeah, actually the, the Green Cities Initiative that was launched um, at the end of 2020 was uh, the rationale of the initiative was exactly to um, somehow uh, support uh, cities and local governments to better address global challenges like food security, and nutrition, and climate change by integrating the somehow the agri-food system dimension and the green spaces dimension, no? and to help cities managing uh, the different agendas, uh, the trade-offs with different development needs, and of course, trying to optimize the, the, the policy and planning process, integrating the, the different elements. So this is uh, exactly the entry point and the main rationale to, to have promoted the Green Cities Initiative. And, um, and of course, uh, it, it, it's, uh, it's um, promoting an integrated urban planning process is very challenging. But of course, uh, it, it is needed to address challenges like climate change and, uh, and, uh, and food security and nutrition. I stop here. Maybe Simone and Cecilia, if you, add, if you want to add anything else. Simone? Can you, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, OK, great. No, uh, thank you, Maria Karen Guido. Just uh, I want to add uh, maybe a uh, uh, small consideration on the point uh, in the question of the city being an organic body. And I think uh, that also reflects the fact that in an organic body, there's a lot of other processes that are happening beyond just the master plan and pilot activities. And these are a lot of uh, spontaneous uh, things that are happening in the city. I think one of the tasks often is also to understand those processes and then try to accompany them uh, you know, by uh, many different ways. And I'm thinking of Cairo in particular, I know there's a lot of you know, urban agriculture happening on the roofs of, of buildings. There's a lot of other you know, uh, spaces being taken over by local people. So I think in addition to the formal, let's say, planning process and the formal, let's say, pilot activities, accompanying these different processes and learning uh, from uh, what they're doing, creating uh, micro enterprises that can uh, support these projects might also be some interesting additional points that could be added. So I think when you're looking at organic or living bodies like cities, there's a lot of things that are happening that we might not be fully aware of, and we also need to understand how to take uh, the maximum advantage of those uh, dynamics to <clears throat> build up towards a, a greener, right? so let's say, uh, let's say our key slogan is greener, healthier, and happier uh, cities. And so I think these uh, should also be part of that uh, that discourse. Back to you, Maria Chiara, thanks. Thank you, Simone. Um, I follow to the second question from Charlotte Fletchett. Fletchett, yes. Sorry for the mispronunciation eventually. Hi, Garrett, very interesting presentation, thank you. Uh, from your experience, what are some of the most successful entry points to involve citizens in urban foods planning discussion? Thanks, Charlotte. Thank you, Charlotte, and, and greetings. And greetings to all at Rocoto. Um, yeah, a fantastic question, and I, I think for me, uh, I'll answer the question in two ways. I think for me, one is that I think there are fascinating processes to mobilize citizen movements in many cities. Often those are context relevant and context specific. So there might be a particular groups around faith-based groups, there might be places where conversations could be held. 
women's savings clubs, etc. And so I think it's a key knowledge, and forgive me for sounding too much like an academic, that context is key, but I do think understanding those contextual realities, the reference to Cairo and the roofs, etc. How do we understand what's going on and how does one serve to reinforce those processes rather than potentially trying to create new? Perhaps a rather high level answer to that. But what I, I have seen has become incredibly powerful is to conduct food sensitive planning workshops in specific communities. And here what we've done is we've used icons as a way so we deal with problems of language and translation and literacy, etc, and aerial photography. And we ask people to draw pictures of their homes and their places of food, pre food preparation. We don't call it a kitchen, some might have a stove outside, some might use fire, etc. And we ask them to draw this image from a planning, a plan point of view and map it out using icons. And then we scale out to the neighborhood and ask these particular, that same neighborhood or community to map out the infrastructure that they use to go to work, to go to school, to go to pray, et cetera. And in mapping out that infrastructure, we then ask them to say where they access food in that particular space. And what gets generated is an incredibly rich resource that is embedded by an unknown knowledge of community members of their daily work and life in a city. And those become very powerful maps to allow for an articulation of the particular food system that is often unseen by planners sitting in sort of high uh, air conditioned government offices and my, no disrespect to, to any officials, but it's kind of connects to the real on the ground experience. And I think that's just one example. There are many that can be used. The other is one that has been particularly useful is to use a process called Theory U of learning journeys where one brings early childhood development center principals who are responsible for providing food for very young children into the same space as various different government officials from various different spheres of government, not to have a conversation, to walk that city, walk that space, and to engage in these various different processes. So everyone starts to sense the same experience of the food system that that particular early childhood center person might have, then come back and have an engaged very carefully and curated facilitated conversation around what the government can do, what the needs might be, and trying to find points. There's never necessarily going to be an immediate solution, but trying to find the points of connection where different forms of governance and action can take place. I'll leave it as that. There are others, I, inshallah, I'm more than happy to engage in this as well. And hopefully we can speak to some of this. There is a component, Maria, sorry, in the course run by, uh, on this, in, in the, in the in one of the modules of the course as well. Cecilia, do you want to add anything on that maybe? Thank you, Gareth, for the answer. Thank you, Gareth, and thank you, Margara. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, yes, just I mean to complement what Gareth was mentioning, um, just thinking that one uh, entry point for involving cities could be uh, the, the food governance. I mean, many cities that uh, are integrating, as Gareth was mentioning, many cities that are starting integrating food system in their uh, local policy or local planning or even in their local action, uh, they, uh, they start establishing a food system governance mechanism. So multi-stakeholder process, which involve different actors related to food systems systems and they can uh, and through this multi-stakeholder process they start designing a food strategy or the vision of cities for uh, how do they want to see cities in five years uh, in terms of food system transformation and they choose the different entry point and they uh, promote and they identify uh, the the action plan uh, the priority area where to uh, to, to, for starting in, in mainstreaming uh, food system in their planning. And I guess this uh, food governance mechanism, this food lab uh, that at community level, uh, this uh, food policy council more institutionalized at city level, 
are fundamental uh, mechanism for starting uh, engaging different uh, uh, typology of different stakeholders, uh, different citizens, and also including the most uh, vulnerable people. Uh, don't, without forgetting that one of the key point is really that uh, planning is a decision-making process. And if we more we involve cities and more we do this process participatory, uh, more is possible to have uh, the um, inclusivity, inclusive planning, uh, um, uh, inclusive planning mechanism, inclusive planning process, and uh, more uh, um, more connection among different sectors, because this is uh, another point that we should mainstream through planning. The planning department are the one that could create the connection among different sector and could really uh, engage uh, different uh, cities, different uh, stakeholders and different actors uh, at city level. Thank you, Cecilia. Now we have a question in French. So our interpreter, interpreter will help us with the English translation of this sentence. Do you want me to read in French, Miguel? It is a change into the two. Just a second. Okay, uh, I'm going to try my French. Don't worry. Bonjour, j'aimerais savoir quelle est la méthode de gouvernance par rapport à l'agriculture urbaine présentée tout à l'heure. Quel est le rôle de l'État par rapport à ces projets? Est-ce que c'est est -ce, est -ce est la collectivité qui gère les produits? Um, uh, uh, to this uh, question, I would uh, ask maybe Guido to answer uh, at the very beginning and maybe Garrett, do you want to elaborate on that? Thank you, yeah. Um, I think every city is different and every region might have different governance processes. Uh, across Africa, I think there are all these very different histories. Very often, and again, it's, it's uh, if I understood the question in terms of managing produce and uh, Guido and others, I know you've done a lot of work on this, so please correct me here. But it, it's, it's also a, what often happens is whether that food all goes into the market. Some of that food might just be used for home consumption. Uh, uh, you know, as Simone mentioned, if you're taken off the roof, etc. And so this might be very localized, it might be very, um, it might be secondary, or it might be the main source of food, one doesn't know. So one, you know, these questions are, as a broad general term, I think it's often there. What I, I will say is, uh, from my work around histories of urban agriculture, often it was not permitted, it is increasingly permitted, and it has been, and there has been a significant change and there are urban agriculture projects in cities or every city that I work in. Most of that production is produced for more localized market access. Some of the large peri-urban areas, and I think it's useful to distinguish between urban agriculture and peri-urban, some of the larger areas of land are producing commercially. That might go to the local market, it might be processed near or on the farm, it might go to wholesale markets and might be distributed from there. So I do think they're very different components to that. And again, I'm sounding, referring to context too often, and I apologize for that. But I do think, to answer your question, I think it's around the contextual rules, the histories of a particular town or city, and the ways in which the food system has been allowed, constrained, and the policy processes that play out. And so one of the areas for me, and just to mention this, that in understanding the city and that point about using Chesakone market as an example, one of the processes is not just understanding the physical food system, but we do this work that we ask, we ask, we understand the intervention system. So we look at all policies from constitutional mandates to the roles of local government, to the 
the laws around urban governance, the laws around agriculture, and we try to understand what that might mean and where the entry points might sit for local authorities to take greater control of that governance of that system. So yeah, a, a very sort of high level response, but hopefully that's helpful in that sense. But others I'm sure would also have very useful contributions to that. Thank you, Gareth. Uh, Guido, uh, do you want to elaborate? Uh, maybe a few more words. I think uh, what Cecilia and Gareth said covers uh, quite a lot of what I wanted to say. But I think uh, it's important to, um, okay, governance is a key instrument of uh, promoting integrated planning now, we, in any case, uh, and we strongly support these in, in, in FAO in, as a general approach. But of course, the, the way it is uh, um, designed and implemented uh, locally, it really depends on the context. No? So uh, whether it will be managed by local authorities of the civil society of the national government, it really depends on where you are. No? The important thing is that it's key to involve in this process all the actors, institutional and civil society actors, they have a stake in this, no? And, and of course, uh, in, uh, more specifically in urban agriculture, urban agriculture is a, a, an important reality in most of African cities, but of course, it's also very informal, no? In, in most of the cases, not uh, um, regulated and not integrated into a, a planning process, and this creates um, uh, some challenges also in, in, uh, in the way land is used and resources are used like water, for example. So it's very key that is integrated into a planning process, into land use planning, and also in a, in a governance mechanism that involves actors from agriculture, but not only actors from agriculture. So the entire food system at different levels, local and, and, and national level. Thank you. Thank you, Guido. Um, there was a question to Patson from Patson Piri to Gareth. I don't know, Gareth, if you want to like elaborate a bit on that. Uh, Gareth, how do we balance the growing urban population pressure with the demand of, for urban space to grow food? So thanks, Vesson. <laughs> I, I, I think for me, this is a really great question. And it's a real tension that many governance actors face. Um, and I think, it's a similar question to the one that Florence also answered around how do city officials focus on food and deal with competing priorities? How do you deal with the challenges of urbanization, the rapid scale of urbanization that is taking place in cities? In Zambia, seeing how Kitwe and Nindola and other cities and Lusaka are growing so rapidly, and a whole lot of other intermediary and much smaller cities are also growing rapidly. For me, the central question is, for local governments to have a food mandate. If they don't have a food mandate, this question, uh, to use a sort of management 101 question, if you're going to manage something, you have to wake up and worry about it. And if it's not the city's responsibility to wake up and worry about food and peri-urban agriculture or all this land, but it is to manage about, worry about housing and worry about controlling rapid urbanization, that's going to take priority. And so for me, the question has to be about how cities take on and smaller towns take on this urban food mandate and accept and appreciate that they have to manage food and that focus then allows for a far greater sensibility and sensitivity to the peri-urban areas to the areas of land through planning regulations bylaws etc that can enable a measure of control and to restrict that it's not just around state land, it's also around privately owned land where people are able to sell to a property developer to make a whole lot of money. How do the planning regulations, how do those see food as an apex requirement? One's not going to try and colonize a school playground to do a property development because schooling and education is seen as that apex role. Why isn't food there at the moment? And so how through this process is food seen as being central to all aspects of urban life. We worry about transport, we worry about air pollution, we worry about urban health, but cities often haven't got the mandate to worry about urban food. And I think it needs to be reasserted in a way that food has to become a key urban governance responsibility. It's again, another high level response, but hopefully that, that 
that, that hopefully the course will allow the various different city actors to respond to that. And I see someone has a comment to that as well. And um, maybe Cecilia, do, we, do you want to elaborate a bit on that? Yeah, no, thank you. Uh, totally in agreement with Gareth. Just to add a small, uh, a quick uh, uh, and small uh, component, the, the oh, issue nice. of uh, who is the urban planner and, and uh, uh, what is, uh, I mean, because uh, urban planners should go beyond their professional boundaries and trying and start connecting uh, the different sectors. And this means that also food should start to be mainstreaming, mainstreamed in the university curricula so of urban planner. If you look at the, uni uh, the university curricula of urban planner, food is not there. So while uh, cities are dealing, you, you can read cities through food. Uh, so while green spaces are well recognized as part of the uh, curricula for uh, urban planner, the connection, let's say the disinnovation of the FAO Green Cities Initiative, the connection between green spaces and food and the importance of food in urban planning is not in the university curricula. That is something we should work worldwide and uh, uh, for, uh, for making food part of the, of, the, of the curricula of urban planners. Over. Thank you, Cecilia, because I think that this is worldwide and also I think ACC and uh, Polymi, uh, we try and take this challenge on. Um, we are working very hard to introduce some of these challenges already. Uh, and I'm speaking about uh, Polymi, but I'm pretty sure that also uh, ACC is working very much on that side. Can I jump uh, in for a sec, uh, Marikera? Yeah, sure. Yes, and no, 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 thank you, Gareth and Cecilia. I mean, I think those are very relevant comments, and I, you know, I think from a bird's eye perspective, those work well. But I think one point that, um, and we are particularly keen to sort of move forward is the idea that um, we need to get away from uh, maybe looking at one function for one space, but really looking at you know space is limited uh, that we know, and you know cities are growing. So I think uh, increasingly we start, should start looking at uh, spaces, multifunctional green spaces. Uh, no one says that if you're growing potatoes, you can also have recreation there too, or you know, try and really look at how these uh, limited spaces can become multifunctional areas in which people can you know, spend time, produce food, get out of the heat, and all at the same time. And I think that was probably one of the challenge is really how to maximize uh, the use of those limited remaining spaces to actually carry out a wide range of different functions that can you know, help at least address some of the challenges that we are discussing today. And there are some, I think, good examples of uh, food forests or urban agroforestry or other similar you know, combinations of uh, functions, you know, agriculture and water management and shade to production that could be really relevant uh, during this, uh, let's say, as we move on in this discussion on what is a green city and how can we actually uh, get that. Over to you, Maria Chiara. Thank you. Um, there is a question by Gianni. How the city planners can realize the importance and the benefits of integrating agriculture food in the urban planning strategy? How those green benefits uh, can be understood and implemented well? how to combine them with a uh, commercial and industrial development plan. Thank you. I would ask uh, Ali Ulke to answer and uh, I would be happy to elaborate uh, after her. Hi, Maria, sorry, my connection broke up and I'm trying to follow the, the question. Can, can you so, repeat which yes, one it was? Sure. How the city planners can realize the importance and the benefits of integrated agriculture food uh, in the urban planning strategy? How yes. those green benefits can be understood and implemented well, how to combine them with industrial and um, sorry, commercial development plan. Thank you. Yeah, I will, so, I will also elaborate after you. Thank you, Ali. Great, thanks. Yeah, so I, I responded and, and I think this is a great question and it's actually one that I'm trying to answer for my own doctoral research. So if anyone has some answers as well, that would be great, <laughs> that would be helpful for me. Um, but what I can say is that um, from the, the city of Cape Town's perspective, at least with Gareth and, and Jane and colleagues at the African Center for Cities, is that the way we've gone about it is, is 
almost in a, in a lobbying form, but kind of like a, a quiet lobbying where you consistently approach and engage with city officials and particularly those who are able to influence the spatial plans um, and wide scale metro, metropolitan urban plan or spatial plans. Um, and in this sense, we have had some progress where we've got a number of city officials on board who we can interact with and, and have their ear um, when the city is developing new spatial development frameworks, for example. But it is a very slow process and can sort of wax and wane depending on the political leadership of the time. So there was a time when we were not taken seriously at all and now we are kind of, you know, in the, in the good books again. But as Gareth mentioned previously, every city is different. So you really do need to, to see what would work in, in your context. And as Gareth has also said, context is key. So yeah, Maria, if, if you'd like to add on to yes. that, you're welcome. Uh, I think that uh, one of the key questions, within the question, I think that there is a key element that we really need to raise up the knowledge on the green benefits, uh, on what they are doing within the cities. Uh, I think that this is, a very important element because if you have uh, the technical component and you know where to do, how to do, and how to integrate a, a, a green space, but then you don't know, uh, so you don't have from one side the people's knowledge on why this is important. And from the other side, you need to communicate to the political and technical uh, uh, decision making. Uh, so these are the other two key elements to be poured into this because you can have the best technical answer but if you don't have the population from one side and the ex the technological the, sorry the technical component on the other then you, you cannot pursue your uh, objective so i think that the participation of the population but but also the knowledge that the people have to have on this matter is very important so that's why we really need to spread why it is so important on having food and urban uh, and sorry and green uh, system within our cities is so seminal. I don't know if uh, any uh, from FAO want to answer or I proceed to the next question. Shall I? Thanks. Um, uh, yeah, um, il y aura in the, the financement specific par ce type de projet afin de motiver nous, nous gouvernement à s'engager dans ce type de projet. Uh, so if, if there is any financial specifically to this matter, uh, in order to incentivize our government to uh, engage on this uh, project. Um, I can provide a question and answer and Gareth, please go ahead. So many, thanks so much. I think for many African cities who are incredibly, you know, they're really battling from a resource access point of view, particularly the intermediary cities and smaller cities. One of the really useful points and where we found significant traction is to show that how a focus on food, urban greening, uh, urban and peri-urban agriculture allows the city to address not just the food question, but a whole set of other social questions. So it's, the term is often double duty actions. So you, if, by, if you only have a certain amount of resourcing, one's then able to use that limited resourcing to have exponential benefits that come through food in terms of urban health, in terms of educational opportunities, in terms of air cleaning processes and a whole set of processes that come together. Often those combined aspects are more attractive to donors and funders as well. They're more difficult to manage but it also allows access to that. But my caution there is then for the cities to determine what they're going to do rather than have those donors and funders determine what that outcome is going to be. But what we have found in our work that we're doing in, in a number of smaller towns and cities is the attractiveness of trying to understand urban food system. It allows a rethinking of, of taxi rank planning and how the taxi rank might plan. They might get funding for transport, but they're unable to use a food lens, as Cecilia said, to think of how that transport interchange can be re-engineered to become a place of retail, a place of access to government services, et cetera, understanding how those transport interchanges work. So I think to th I would suggest, and my response to the question is, food allows us to see these multiple other urban infrastructure and 
urban system intersections and one can then focus on all of those and there may be funding for different ones and one can then increase the impact rather than focusing on key individual projects and processes again yeah hopefully that's of use in some space yeah so there are other questions so i don't know if you uh, can i proceed with the other do you do you mind so that we um so we try and succeed to answer them all um Giovanna Ottaviani Almo, thank you so much for the presentations. My question is, to which extent do you think that current urban agricultural practices could contribute to diet transition in the urban context? We know that diversification is a problem now for the low income segment of the society in African city. So do we need something new in terms of structure, implementation and access? Um, maybe Guido, do you want to elaborate a bit? Yeah, I think um, you know, the question is, uh, is, is very relevant, but also not, it's a bit complex to answer, to give an answer. In general terms, uh, urban agriculture contribute, can contribute a lot to diversification as a basis. In many African cities, for many families, especially from poor areas, it can be the only way to diversify diets no? and, and to, to add or uh, with to complement staple food with the high value foods, um, healthy food, basically. So it's, it really can contribute a lot to diversification. But also when associated with the school um, schools programs or school gardening, for example, can also be an important contribution to, to build nutrition education and contribute to this transition. Of course, uh, the, the, the answer is so that as also mentioned in my previous answers, that urban agriculture has to be in, in embedded into a planning process no? in order to be included uh, into different uh, uh, programs under the responsibility of the city that could be school programs, but also public procurements. No? These are um, key elements uh, embedding agriculture in this, uh, in this context is fundamental to use agriculture to build on agriculture as a basis to promote this transition i don't know if this the answer somehow satisfied your your question thank you guido i'm going to the last question i'm seeking guidance on the following a uh, this is from deogratius kiryova uh, do we do we have some key example in east africa specifically in uganda B, integration of food system in urban planning is not only a planning issue, but also environmental, political, and economic issue. How best can all stakeholders be brought to understand and play their roles? C, in a country like Uganda, uh, where citizens own land, land belongs to people, and in some areas, people occupy, construct before servicing, and planning um, are done. How can you change si such an environment to be food system responsive? Uh, thank you, Deogratis from Kampala, Uganda. Um, I don't know, Gareth, uh, uh, do you want to uh, answer um, something? I, I can provide also some help with uh, some of the issues. I don't know, colleagues. Thanks, Deogratis. And again, my apologies. I don't understand don't know the Ugandan context very well, but I do have a number of colleagues that work with organizations like IFPRI, uh, ICLI and others who are from Uganda, who work very closely, who are planners and urban designers. I think what you describe is that last slide that I presented of this tension between sort of bottom-up planning that's happening and, and people sort of occupying the African city versus the aspiration of top-down planning. And I, I think for me, what this demands is it places a very a far greater demand on, on three components. Um, and to build on what Simone said uh, around how the micro right the way up to the large macro has to be considered in how we understand things. Those processes that are taking place in small, small right the way through to larger planned formalized engagements. Second, I think for me, it is about the centrality of having food as been seen, and I've made the point already, so I won't belabor it, but seeing food as a key urban mandate and a key urban governance position that has to be taken and held and reclaimed. 
But thirdly, I, I think there is this real tension of how those planners engage across the food system continuum from high levels of formality in the building of a large shopping mall and a HACCP controlled production plant right the way to an informal street vendor who's selling Rolexes on, the, on a table that moves from an intersection and Rolex in the term of food, the rolled up food, not the Rolex watches. And so how these different actors in the food system are seen as having equal access and equal voice in the food system. Because I, I do feel that often a large component is excluded and, and this then erodes the sense of what the food system is. It erodes the prestige of what those multiple actors might be. And it does in many impact, in, in many effects, kind of erode the, the spatial form and starts to create an impression that agriculture happens outside the city and it has no place in the city. And again, so this becomes a point around when food is seen as being of and in and conclude and part of the city from urban agriculture to food vending to processing, et cetera, and how that is governed becomes an important component. There is always the tension of politics and how it might be seen as not being something that happens and there is no political will to support that process and support planners and officials doing that work. And I think this is the evolving tension and I don't have an answer to your question, but I do think that these are the questions we need to be asking and engaging. Hopefully the course will provide some tools for that, but never enough. And so this is about the ongoing work of trying to bring food into the African city in very different ways. And yeah, so again, a somewhat yeah, vacuous response, but I do think it's really important from that point of view, but I'll hand over to me at here. Thank you. <laughs> Add some real knowledge to it. So there is uh, one extra question. So I would give the floor, to, I'll read the, the question and then we will uh, then conclude. So Francisco Manuel Vieira Livramento says in French, actuellement beaucoup de gens Ici, au Cap Vert, cultivant des plantes ornementales, car c'est une source de revenus pour le budget familial. Maintenant, il faut encourager les gens à cultiver des denrées de, de alimentaires. Que pouvons-nous faire en termes de désensibilisation? So, the main the question is uh, how to switch from uh, uh, ornamental plants to uh, plants that produce food in order to um, uh, enlarge these. Uh, uh, matter, uh, what can we do in terms of uh, engagement and um, no acknowledgement? Uh, um, maybe Cecilia, do you want to take on this question? So, uh, so we can. I mean, I think uh, what is important to move uh, from, uh, uh, to, to give, I mean, to consider productive uh, green space as part uh, of, the, of the planning process uh, is really to work, uh, uh, to, to, to give importance uh, to, to food again in, the, in, uh, in, in cities and in city planning. And uh, uh, so, and is not only production, but all the component of the food system is producing, but also market, but also food waste management, and to raise awareness on the importance of all the component of the food system in order to ensure that we uh, can move uh, from uh, ornamental, as you said, green uh, spaces to more productive uh, uh, green spaces. Sh food should be recognized as a, as a priority. And, uh, and in many cities, we are not yet there, but one thing that could help is for sure the exchange among cities. There are many good practices around the world and so FAO, for instance, uh, and many city network uh, are uh, like ECLEI or, uh, or C40 or uh, UCLG and uh, even, I mean, uh, the uh, in many initiative that related to, to, to food, but even green space, foster the city to city exchange. 
So um, a report uh, showing uh, and uh, how other cities are, uh, mind, are introducing productive green spaces within uh, the, the urban planning could be a way uh, to, um, uh, to get inspired, for other cities to get inspired. So as FAO, uh, we consider the city to city exchange, including the triangular cooperation, uh, a key component of our uh, Green Cities Initiative, Arbor Food Agenda, all the work that we are doing at city level. And uh, this could help for raising awareness and get other cities be inspired. Okay. Thank you, Cecilia. One, Prego, one. Please, Simone. Um, I, I'm not sure I got the full uh, you know, question, but I think I understand probably they producing ornamentals for export, I assume, because it looks like uh, it's not you know, urban production, but more general production. Now, um, one thing that I, I think might uh, be interesting for this type of uh, uh, small island uh, production in particular We'll be really that of looking at uh, linking up with the local tourist industry and somehow uh, many uh, small islands have an issue of uh, actually importing food from from outside and maybe if uh, they could set up a, a label or something that you know locally produce food and then sell it in the hotels of course once you know, covid is completely gone and tourism gets up it might be a way to actually raise the issue of needing to produce locally and having a local label <clears throat> so once again i mean we need more context to possibly understand exactly what the, the person meant in this question but i think that that might also be one way of starting to produce uh, food locally again uh, by paying a premium price for for locally maybe organic or whatever you want to call it uh, food over to you thank you simone so uh, we are ending up this uh, open webinar. Uh, thank you for all of you to listen to our webinar. I uh, just uh, want to tell you that we've been uh, uh, putting together a small uh, survey uh, here in the link, but also we will send you by email. It's very important uh, to know if uh, this uh, webinar has been helpful. So uh, please take two minutes, not more than two minutes to uh, provide us a, a small feedback uh, on what this uh, webinar has uh, been uh, for you. And uh, I would also ta um, take the opportunity to um, thank uh, Gareth Asom and Alison Pulker from ACC, uh, to thank uh, uh, FAO group uh, Simone Borelli, Guido Santini, Cecilia Marocchino, and uh, Gilles Martin, and to the uh, METI team from Politecnico di Milano for this uh, wonderful organization from the webinar support. And again, uh, I just uh, uh, give, uh, to, to, uh, give to the end by saying to you that we're going to be at the World Urban Forum with a training uh, session. So please uh, look uh, uh, for our uh, webinar uh, in, uh, and in presence in Katowice in June. And then we will also um, wrap up our training session in November. So stay tuned because we have uh, other uh, wonderful uh, meetings uh, together. Uh, so uh, thank you to all of you. Bye, thank you. Thank you everybody. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you Maria Fiora for everything. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Maria.